Operations, Intergovernmental Relations, and Public Transportation Committee to order. Would you please take the roll call? Calling the roll, Ms. Baker. Here. Ms. Simon. Here. Mr. Hauser. Mr. Hauser is absent. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is absent at the moment. Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller is absent. There is not a quorum. All right. Uh, is there any public comment? Uh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, two people have signed in. Okay. First is Alana Faith. Okay. Uh, next is Ms. Lou. And also, I'd like the record to reflect that Council Member um, Jones is in attendance and you do have a quorum. Good afternoon. Uh, very nice to see all of you back from the little summer break. And and also, I still want to say that I'm so happy that Inspector General right now is built into our charter in our government. However, I just wish this department will have its own designated funding. We can still work on it. <laughs> uh, right now, I'm here. Uh, that's because today's topic maybe is about uh, it's this department's own report. However, we have to depend on this department for lots of different things. Just like in daily lives, people have to depend on RTA. Also, RTA right now is a, our only public transit authority. And also, this committee also pays attention to all these things. As you may know, um, they are right now in search for the new CEO, new general manager. However, it seems that they even don't really know, the board members don't really know exactly what kind of job description they should put on. Because the last time when they had a serious hiring, it was 19 years ago. Lots of things changed. 19 years ago, we have heard people coming here to testify that public transportation was in better condition. They actually could utilize that very well. However, 19 years later now, uh, I think you all have heard there are lots of people coming here to say they lost the bus, they couldn't go to work, they couldn't go to do anything they need to do. So please pay attention. If the board members cannot be knowledgeable to think on their own, when the county has a chance to appoint a new board members, please, if you can possibly recommend our executive to select a real writer, maybe with business background, maybe with a union background, but please, we need a writers to be on the board. So the board will give them the new idea about what is in real life, what is a public transit could do people for people's real life, for the environment, for our economy, for the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Uh, no, Madam Chair, no one else has signed in. All right, uh, at this time we do have a quorum. Um, may I have um, a motion and second? Uh, I'll, make I'll make the motion. All right. Mm -hmm. Super Domena, second. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, hearing um, all approve? Aye. Aye. Okay, minutes are approved. I hear no nays, thank you. All right, the uh, matters that were referred to committee, there are none, so we're going to move right into discussion with our uh, agency of Inspector General, Mark Griffin, who will be giving us a semi-annual report from January 1st, 2018 to, Jan to June 30th, 2018. Welcome to committee. Thank you, Chairwoman Baker. Uh, Mark Griffin, Inspector General, uh, Councilman Jones, Councilman, Councilwoman Simon, it's a pleasure to, to come and speak with you about what the office has done during the first six months of uh, 2018. And let me give you kind of a brief overview and then uh, I'd like as much as possible to have a discussion so that you can pose questions to me uh, because ultimately my job is to be responsive to you and to the taxpayers of Cuyahoga County uh, 
to let you know what we've been doing. Uh, so the first six months of 2018, one of the most important things that we've been doing is working and cooperating with law enforcement agencies regarding ongoing investigations with respect to public corruption. Uh, as the um, county executive mentioned in his state of the county address earlier this year, some of those were triggered by our earlier investigations and we continue to spend substantial amounts of time and effort to work cooperatively with them. Uh, as you know, under our ordinance, uh, the rules are that once we believe that there is a reasonable possibility of criminal conduct, we're required to make referrals, and then we're also required to stand down and make sure that we don't interfere with uh, the activities of law enforcement, but cooperate with them uh, as much as possible. So we take it to the 10-yard line, and then uh, they go the rest of the, the field. Uh, in addition, we've also focused on trying to make our budgetary process work more efficiently. And so in working with the Office of Budget and Management, we identified 1.4 million in unused county funds that needed to be decertified. Uh, we worked with them as well and identified another 4.1 million uh, that could also be decertified to speed up the, the return of those uh, monies to the, the general fund or their, their appropriate uh, project funds. Um, we identified $700,000 in funds, tax, unpaid taxes that were owed by county contractors. Um, as part of our investigation work, we completed 27 investigations. We worked cooperatively also with the county's internal auditor to look at best practices for uh, conflicts of interest. But then also as part of our cooperation with uh, the county's internal auditor, we also uh, worked to hire a third party to review the county's responses to criminal subpoenas submitted to the county. Um, and we, as part of that, hired and reviewed the work of Vestige Limited, uh, which is a, a, an IT auditor. Uh, we continued our uh, monitoring of improvements to the Department of Development's loan servicing program. Um, just briefly, out of the uh, 296 loans that we looked at during the first six-month period, 187 have been reviewed. Um, there remain additional, uh, uh, which they, they have promised to review by the end of this year. So there is significant progress uh, on that level. Um, we continue to be uh, very proactive with respect to uh, ethics education. We send out regular ethics updates to remind uh, county employees of the county ethics code. And, and we understand that something that's simply written doesn't really come to life unless we try to make an effort to reach out and explain the legalese in plain uh, language and plain English. So we, we try to send out regular, um, regular ethics updates to create a culture of compliance. And so as part of that, we've responded to 66 ethics advisory opinions and inquiries uh, as part of that proactive um, ethics policy. Uh, we also reviewed 2,339 contractors with respect to background checks. Uh, 1,841 driver's license uh, drivances uh, were reviewed. Uh, and then we also worked with the County Charter Review Commission to offer to voters the option of putting uh, our organization into this charter. So that's an overview, and there's a lot of detail behind each of those, and I'm happy to to uh, go into further depth on each of those, but I'd like to really respond to your thoughts and your inquiries uh, to give you whatever additional information you seek. All right, wow, that was nice and concise. Thank you. Uh, I, I, have an, I have an hour of uh, <laughs> conversation, but I don't think that would be right. all that helpful. Well, uh, I know we've all had a chance to review the, uh, the report, and uh, I guess we should really start there if, uh, you would like uh, our Inspector General to go over the report, or would you like to ask questions that um, you have found by reading it? Is there a preference by the members of this committee? You can go over the report. All right. I think that would be a good idea. Why don't we go over the report? We all have it in Great. front of us. And let me point out that, that uh, we do have uh, uh, in our audience today Greg Huth from the Department of Development. And, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to Mr. Huth uh, and also to Brian Edwards uh, from his staff because they've really made important improvements in the Department of Development loan portfolio. Uh, we have been very concerned with the county's prior failure to keep accurate records and to accurately correct uh, or collect on those. And so um, one of the things that I can say is that thanks to them, they now have uh, 
actually one of the things that I like is I use the term reconcile and they tell me, no, 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 that's not correct because there's a specific accounting uh, process. But what they have done is they've reviewed all of the loans since the restructuring of our county organization and they uh, have reached to their satisfaction confirmation with respect to the accuracy of those records and the payments and not all of those loans of course uh, are current some are some are late but they are taking appropriate steps for everything uh, since our county was reorganized their biggest problem is uh, with respect to those loans that were issued or approved during the commissioner's age and agenda and uh, they are continuing to look at those. Uh, some of those are going to be very difficult because the records were not maintained, uh, but others they're, they're pursuing on. So uh, because Mr. Huth is here in particular, I want to say thank you to him for, for his good efforts and also use that as an opportunity to, to give you an update. Let me give you an example of what their process has been able to find. So in going back and trying to look at how interest was calculated on each loan, on just one loan, for example, they found $40,000 uh, that was owed to the county that had been inappropriately uh, calculated. So that's another example of, of how they are uh, being responsive and looking at things. And, and uh, one of the things that I said to Director Carter in a meeting last week was, was the biggest change, in my view, is the change of culture that Mr. Huth and Mr. Edwards have brought to the department, where instead of pushing back and uh, fighting us on every issue, they have instead been very proactive in identifying the problems. And so, uh, although I would like everything to be done yesterday, uh, I believe that they're, in the, the, um, they're on the right track. And so I wanna say thank you to them uh, and I appreciate his presence here today. Good, so from, from what you just stated and from what I'm hearing, the um, Department of Development with all the um, issues that have been dealt with for, since my tenure here in the last year and a half or a little more, that we are, in your opinion, confident that the loans that were from seven, eight years ago are now identified. They are on a process of being billed if they need to be billed, and we are accountable for those loans since the inception of this new government. Uh, Chairwoman, yes, that's correct. And, and let me give you another example of where things, where they're paying attention to uh, the details and crossing the T's and dotting the I's. One of our criticisms was that there were not there was not monthly invoicing for debtors to the county. Uh, they have since started that, and since they began the monthly invoicing, the number of late payments has gone up 85 uh, percent, uh, and they're invoicing on a regular basis everyone who owes on a monthly basis. Uh, I, I would say this though, which is as part of this review. Um, it's my understanding that the state auditor is also taking a look at things. And, and really, when the new team came in in 2017, they finally got those records uh, correct. So there's going to be a difference between uh, what they found in 2017 and what was previously reported in 2016. So, uh, so I do expect that there's going to be some changes or uh, alterations to those numbers. Uh, but that is really the, the, the function of people who are now on board correcting things. Mm -hmm. and, and the irony of our timing is that uh, some of the criticism is occurring because of the conduct in the past, uh, and I don't want the people who are trying to fix things and are fixing things uh, to be associated with the problems that they're finding and fixing. They, they shouldn't be criticized for fixing things. Right, and I, I, I note in your report on page 25 that um, that work from the old loans that are the most difficult to track should be finally finalized by the end of this year. Do you feel that that timeline is, um, is doable or do you think we are going to see a postponement? Uh, so council chair, uh, following up on our meeting and our conversation yesterday, I reached out to the department of development to ask, you know, okay, where are we on getting everything reviewed by the end of this year? And they, they confirmed that they would have every loan reviewed by December 31st of this year. And again, they said, don't use the term reconcile because that involves, uh, apparently that is specific auditor terminology, and I'm a lawyer, not an auditor, that involves a process of looking at actual invoices and receipts. They're going to go back and look at our records, which, which may or may not meet the the accounting definition of reconciling. So my understanding is that they're going to have everything reviewed by the end of this year. Does that mean there'll be closure 
or does that mean that it'll be reviewed for future um, needing reconciled or, uh, you know, what does that mean? It's does my mean? understanding it means that they will come to a number and a, uh, a satisfaction of accuracy uh, as best they can of the records that we have. For some loans, it's my understanding we simply don't have uh, all of the records. And so um, they're going to take it as far as they can to get to a level of accuracy. But the other piece that I would say is is it's an ongoing process. Um, uh, when you are, you have to keep your books up to date every single month. So there's never an end point. There's never a point where we say everything is perfect. Just as if you were to reconcile your uh, monthly checkbook, that's going to change on a regular basis. Right. I, I guess, though, when we're talking about the, the legacy or the history that does have a beginning and an end because new county government took over, I would hope we could bring some closure to those old loans that we either can or cannot uh, locate who they are, what they owe, and if they can be billed. Um, I think Absolutely. there is a, a closure there because of the differences in, in the two governments. Anyone else have any questions on this? Yes, Councilwoman. Does it have to be on that or in the report? Um, I can, I can't wait till you're done with those questions. Yeah, I mean, loans. I think, yeah. I guess I would like to know from the Department of Development um, whether they think that at the end of this year, as stated in your report, if they are finally closing the chapter to uh, those years of, um, of some difficult times, and if we can then move on, especially with the uh, new ERP system, that we can move on as of January 1st with, uh, with the loans that we know we are accountable to because they happened within the new county government. Uh, so should I direct that to Mr. Huth? Or, or my understanding is that they will get as close as they can with the documents that they have and that there will be some doc there will be some loans uh, for which we simply don't have accurate records. So so it's my understanding that they will have completed the review of the records that we have. Okay. All right. I guess when we talk to you again in six months, I get the word that question will come up and I would anticipate that question would be the chapters closed. And uh, you know we can we can wait till another six months to, if we needed that final. We're done with that. We've moved on, and here is the account for when we first started our own county government. Um, did you have a question? question. For right. Go right ahead. I, I was curious uh, for those older loans. Yes. Uh, once you reengaged and connected, uh, was there much pushback? And if so, what 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 was the nature of the pushback, and how did we respond? Uh, so it really depends. And again, the 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 outreach has been from um, the Department of Development. And so, in sending out the invoices, uh, sometimes they got responses of saying, "Oh yes, uh, here we need to to pay you back." But in others, uh, there was a dispute as to the amount of money owed. And and by sending out the invoices, they then engaged in the process of well, you claim that you paid this, here's what our records show, and then they, they reached an agreement. So uh, it, it's my understanding that that process has at least gone forward with everyone who they've, they have sent an invoice to. Uh, there are some places that are defaulting. I mean, that's just the nature of loans. Uh, where, but, but in terms of a dispute over uh, what the records show, I think that, that they have invoiced everybody and they're, they're in the process of, of working everything out. Um, so I, I think at least that's a start uh, 12 months ago, we weren't invoicing. Uh, there was sort of a denial of the problem. Uh, and now really, the, the I think the direction and the attitude has uh, changed tremendously. That's great. That's good. And, and, but, but, and having said that, yeah. we're not perfect. They're not perfect. They're still working on it. And, and to the chairwoman's point, uh, I think absolutely that come the end of this year, there should be questions about have we been able to close the, the chapter? Uh, so I'm very happy about the direction. I wish it were finished yesterday. It's not. Uh, and by December 31st, we should, if it's not finished, we should have answers about why it's not. And your goal um, is one of your goals is to continue to oversee a the department. Actually, my goal is to stop overseeing, but that's not <laughs> going to happen until uh, things are, are finished. 
Uh, you know, my office has been engaged in this now for yes. four or five years, and it really hasn't been until the last year and a half uh, that we've seen the progress we've, we've had. I would like nothing more than to use the resources of my office to look for something else. I don't, I don't, we are not a development loan management office. That is not what we do. And if we can turn our attention to other departments, yeah. I would really like to do that. Good. Well, good work on that. I know it has been a long process and we have benefited from, from your work there. Um, why don't we take this section by section? So, um, Councilwoman Simon, I don't know where your question fit. Did you want to ask it now or wait? Till no, we we'll go. There? I'm in section two with a question, okay. so we'll wait to get there. Any questions on section one? It's the um, the structure. I think it's pretty pretty much. Uh, uh, let me take a here. moment, though, uh, right. if I may, Chairwoman, sure. and that is as part of uh, our budget, we were given an extra slot and a half to fill to expand our our uh, personnel, and that was a full slot for a big data analyst yes. and a half slot that would be shared with the internal auditor for uh, uh, for IT work. Uh, and so, uh, although not as part of the end of the six month period, mm -hmm. I'm happy to say that that we have filled the big data analyst position. Uh, Ms. Cicely Woods, who is actually here today, uh, has joined us from uh, the Alabama court system. She started her career actually in the IT side of things, uh, so she's very familiar with with data and technology. Uh, and Kim's highly recommended from from the Alabama court system. And then the shared IT position uh, has been uh, filled as well, uh, but that gentleman will not start until October first. His name is John Cornwell, and he was the IT manager for a uh, a smaller county outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and we're very excited to have him on board, although he is a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Uh, we will try to uh, overlook that. So. Well, welcome to the county. Good to have you. All right. Uh, that's good that you gave us that update. I appreciate that. Uh, as we get into uh, Section 2 and the investigations, um, go ahead, Councilwoman. So I'm at Section 2.1A, whistleblower complaints and referrals. Is that the majority of what your department has to oversee and address are these whistleblower complaints or what what percentage of what you're doing consists of those not as much as we would like uh i, I would say i separate our operations into three categories uh, one is investigations, which I think is what everybody expects us to do and really is what people are most interested uh, the second category is uh the office is uh, my role as the chief ethics officer, where we provide ethics education, we issue ethics opinions. Uh, and the third is what I call compliance or administrative work, where uh, where we also have uh, issues about reviewing driver's licenses, uh, doing uh, registration for contractors, conducting background checks. So the investigation side, uh, I would say, is probably about 35 to 40 percent of what we do and there's probably 60% of our resources that are on either these ethics uh, side of things or in the compliance side of things. One of the debates we had when we, day one, had to form this department or chose to was the role of the IG and with contract compliance, making sure that contracts were adhered to and is that and we thought I thought that was really not the role of the IG to review contracts that's more of a, a breach and I, I don't know what you're doing with that if anything um, not enough yeah uh, the answer is I'd like to do more uh, and and um, let me talk a little bit about contract compliance that that we've done um, we issued a report at the end of uh, last year with respect to late contracts to try to um, drive the administration, uh, and I think it's been somewhat successful because they care about it also, to make sure that we're not spending money before it's approved. So so to the extent that that's an element of contract compliance uh, and management, uh, that is something we're doing. We have not, uh, we have done contract compliance uh, on occasion. So for example, we've had some uh, social service providers which uh, uh, were billing us excessively for overhead. So we've looked at that. But we have not, uh, we have not looked at uh, whether the county is getting a fair, uh, getting what has been agreed to under the, the contract as much as we would like. We've left that really up to the managers. 
Um, and, and you know, I mean, there are there are areas where we have concerns in the IT department. I think that no one really knows what we get for those dollars, and so that would be an issue where uh, we are looking at for more oversight. And you have the ability to do that, as we said, right? You don't need any enhancement of your authority from this body. Uh, no, we have the authority. Uh, I think that that in terms of our manpower or person power, as the case may be, yeah. uh, very excited to have uh, Ms. Woods on board, and I think that may be part of her role as well to look at to look at contract compliance. Okay, so so following up on this pie chart, then with regard to the whistleblower complaints, it seems that it's clear the majority of those are coming from the public yes. in that pie chart, but. When I look at the types of investigations, not but in addition, the types of investigations, the majority of those are poor or improper management practices. So do those correlate the public's, what it, A, what's the public complaining about, and B, does it correlate with the improper management practices? It, it, they do to some extent. So, you know, because we try to advertise our, our website and our whistleblower uh, uh, hotline, we end up getting a lot of complaints that may not fall within our um, nature of jurisdiction. Let me give you an example of that. We get a substantial number of complaints about uh, county social workers or uh, uh, folks who handle uh, aid benefits uh, that they are slow or that they're impolite uh, at, or their interaction with this county worker is inappropriate. And so, um, We'll, we do is we then refer that to management rather than initiate an IG investigation. So, so a lot of those public complaints are uh, that people feel so they've been treated rudely or inappropriately. So you just send them along to the right place. They don't know where, where to call apparently, and this is what they think. Exactly, and, and one of the things that my, you know, I hate it when I call someone and they say, "Sorry, that's not my job. I can't do anything." So what we try to do is we try to direct them to the correct person. The, the other thing that happens is, um, you know, the reality is when my office sends a letter, it, it generates a little bit more attention from management than if uh, if someone else does it, and so we try to be helpful in that way as well. Just as a comment before we leave the section. We used to have an ombudsman who you went under the commissioner's structure that was in place, I think, to field questions, a general question, complaints, referral. And we don't, I don't think we have that now. And perhaps your office has been the contact. Is Some, sometimes we are. Yeah. Um, and so we try to be helpful as we can. And, and actually, the other thing that we've seen really in the last six months, in the last year, um, and Councilwoman uh, Simon, as an attorney, you may appreciate this. Uh, we get a lot of complaints that someone has uh, testified in a way that the grievant or complainant believes is, is dishonest or perjurious. Or we get complaints that a magistrate or a judge or someone has made the wrong decision. And so, you know, we we take those complaints, but that's not our role or our jurisdiction. We don't, we, you know, we can't review, we're not an appellate court. Uh, you know, we can't overturn magistrates' decisions, um, and so we refer those as well. So that's also an area of uh, public complaint uh, that we handle, and we try to get those to the right place. It's a lot of work. But, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. You have a question? Go ahead. I'll I found that. once the ombudsmen were eliminated when we first took office, I, I think by nature they started calling us. Right. And uh, I don't know how many times I've had to obviously negotiate and fight and uh, to um, to assist the constituents and employees, so um, we are the the new ombudsman. <laughs> yeah, I have I have a question as well on uh, uh, with the whistleblowers. Uh, we 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 created the debarment tool for for the IG um, many years ago, and, and uh, I, I'd like to have uh, some insight into how that has gone. How many debarments have we done? Um, initially, in the in the creation of it, we were looking to to clean up the past county corruption, those things, and and deal with some of those things. Um, but also, we created the uh, legislation for uh, for the uh, uh, front companies, potential companies who might uh, attempt to take advantage of any uh, minority set asides and those things. Did, have you had any whistleblower complaints in that regard? And 
Have there been any debarments in relation to that? Uh, so we had one complaint uh, relating to uh, minority front companies that was uh, allegedly related to the hotel construction project. And uh, when we followed up with the complainant, uh, he told us that his lawyer had told uh, had had informed him that uh, he should not go forward with his complaint. Uh, we then asked for a little bit of data from our general contractor and didn't find anything to go forward uh, with respect to um, the convention center hotel, the Hilton Hotel that we have. So that was back in 2015, I believe, 2016. So you're saying uh, the whistleblower was asked to withdraw his complaint? Uh, no, his lawyer. So when we called to follow up. Uh, he said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. My attorney has told me I shouldn't talk to you. So that then limited our ability to find further information. Uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of our review of the data that, uh, so we requested uh, um, records from the county's agent to oversee it, uh, which made it look as though, uh, well, the data established that uh, the documents or the MBEs were in fact legitimate MBEs and that although we didn't have goals at that time, uh, that they were making, uh, that they were in fact achieving the results that they had indicated that they would try to do. So, so that's the only MBE front company complaint uh, since 2015 that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, the, the thought process behind it was there might be a need for you, uh, anonymous phone calls. So not necessarily follow up, but an anonymous call, yeah. and um, the language was written in a way for you to do an eyeball test and see if there is any validity to it. Um, I didn't think about the concept of following up with an anonymous phone call. Uh, but even right, so let me just say when the gentleman he didn't withdraw his complaint, but he said he wouldn't work with us anymore. We didn't just stop there. We, okay. You know, we said. Hey, this was something that we looked at. So we we did review the records of uh, uh, of the county's agent and and the prime contractor on there. Uh, but that's really the only one that we have had since then, whether anonymous or named or otherwise. Uh, but but in fact, um, when we brought on a, an attorney last year, one of the things that I spoke with uh, uh, Mr. Thomas about was if these come up, I wanted him to be the point person on that. And and since he's been here. And actually, prior to that, there there have not been complaints, but it's something that we would take very seriously. So just for clarity, although you did not have a follow-up conversation, you did look into the initial complaint and found that um, everything was in order? Correct. Okay, fair to say. Okay. Correct. And, and, and let me just say, we had a follow-up. Uh, it, it wasn't really a conversation, but it was a follow-up contact. But, yeah, I wouldn't call it a conversation because it ended at that point. Okay. Okay. Uh, the pie chart on page 15 has the many methods of, of complaints. So everything from a, a written report to a, a direct phone call. Uh, is there a, are there a certain nature of calls that lend themselves more to in-person and some that are, uh, there's a whole variety of methods here? Uh, sure. Our goal is to make it as convenient as possible for people to file complaints. And so it really depends on the individual uh, and, and who they are, and also kind of what level of confidentiality they want uh, as well. So, so um, I, you know, our goal is to have as many different uh, ways of accessing our system as possible. Mm -hmm. We don't want to just say, oh, I'm sorry, you have to file a form on this particular website, and we won't take your complaint. Otherwise, we'll, we'll take anything. Okay. On the current, on current county employees, uh, is there a certain, could you characterize the type of complaints you get from the, from our current employees? Uh, generally good, um, as in, good complaints. as in, and, and when I say good, I mean uh, generally as, as opposed to those who are outside of our system, that there's some level of information that they have to start with. And so some of our most important investigations have come about because a county employee has said, you need to look at this contract or you need to look at this issue. Uh, now, there are also, there's also a group of complaints where people want to use my office to get back at another employee or to get back at another uh, group of employees. So we've had that kind of go back and forth with some people, but uh, the majority of uh, or the disproportionate number of complaints that we get from county workers are because people care about the system and they care about what we've done. Um, 
the uh, there's the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and they do a review of what inspires or what motivates people to um, to file complaints. And I would have thought that a significant portion of complaints were motivated or tips were motivated by uh, whistleblower rewards, finance, uh, bounties. Uh, if you expose corruption, you get a certain amount of money. But, but in fact, what they found was that it was uh, employees or people who uh, wanted to do the right thing. And, and I think that that's what we're seeing as well, which is people call us. As I mentioned, we have this subset of people who, who want to use us for uh, you know, revenge or inappropriate purposes. But, but most county employees want to do the right thing. And, and I think one of my jobs is to protect the good county employees, of which I think it's 99%, from the 1% who, who uh, may not be doing the right thing. You know, the way I looked at it as uh, going back to the beginning when we, when we first took office, I looked and I watched how they went through the, 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 the corruption scandal and they, they started with the little fish and to work their way up to mm -hmm. big fish. And I always saw the inspector general's office as uh, if we were going to be preventative and keep that type of, of level of corruption happening again, uh, the inspector general's office would be able to... Um, hear the concerns of the little fish now uh, make sure these things were high risk low reward propositions and if things would happen human nature things will happen um, but it would never bubble up to the level uh, as it did before um, if, if we were able to uh, create this line of communication again with the little fish with everyone but uh, at the level of where where we are that things could never get to where they were before. Uh, it, Councilman, uh, you know, I think, and like many and people, I have the misfortune of reading the, the mm -hmm. comment sections in uh, various postings on the Internet where people say, nothing has changed, it's all the same. And, and mm -hmm. it, what I would say is it really has changed. You know, right. we don't have no-show jobs where uh, people don't have to appear for work anymore, at least not to my knowledge. And I'm pretty confident that a county employee would call. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we all know that we live in a uh, a workplace where people like to talk about each other. So if there were no-show jobs, I'm pretty confident that I'd get a call. Uh, nepotism. You know, we had people hiring and supervising their family members. Uh, that is not the case anymore. Uh, but it's also true that, that we have not eliminated uh, every imperfection or ethical violation, and, and we never will. Uh, my office... Um, you know, you don't hire a police force thinking you're going to eliminate all crime. And I don't think an inspector general's office is going to eliminate all ethical conduct. But I do think that there is a substantial improvement with this system of government. Uh, just the fact that you as a council ask questions uh, and that you exercise your oversight role, uh, it, I, I think that that's had real changes in terms of the culture that we have here in the county. And so, so I do think that it's better. I, I hope that the little fish... Uh, feel comfortable uh, reaching out to my office. Um, and, and I think that process has made uh, real improvements. Good, good point. Thank you. Uh, you know, on, your, on page uh, 21 under section 2.2, the closed investigations, you have it uh, marked that you have closed 27. So the question is, how many do you typically have? What is the scope of work that you are continually working with on a, on a regular basis. And I know when we talked earlier, it was about 50 or 60 at one time. So closing 27 is a pretty good mark. Uh, We're doing okay. And, and uh, Councilwoman, so when I left your office, I said, okay, I've got to get an answer for Councilwoman D Baker. What, where are we? Uh, and so uh, at the end of this period, we had 53 open investigations um, uh, and of those, uh, there were some, you know, we try to keep, we have 14 that were over a year old, which is uh, older than I would like. Uh, but those are also, we tend to prioritize. And so things where we think we, where there's going to be a finding of violation, we move more quickly on than others. Uh, so out of that 53 open cases, uh, 29 were less than six months 10 were six months to a year, and 14 were, were over 12 months uh, old. Uh, and, and we are always going to have somewhere between, uh, I think, 10 and 15 okay. uh, older cases, uh, in part because of priorities, also in part because of um, uh, just prioritization of work. 
the other piece is that when we refer something out, whether it's to uh, the Ohio Ethics Commission, the Ohio Attorney General, U.S. Attorney's Office, we then keep those open. And so we're, we're sort of dependent upon them and their process uh, before we can close those administratively. So, uh, so we had 53 open cases. And typically, we close low 20s uh, in terms of investigations in a six-month period. Good. We happen to be above that in the last, last six-month period. All right. That's good to know. Um, also, I wanted to point to page 24 and 25. Um, I think that when our Inspector General gives suggestions on recommendations based on what he has observed over the last six months, those recommendations should be taken seriously. And I hope that one through six um, of the recommendations are looked at seriously and, um, and that those departments uh, who we are recommending to have some accountability in answering whether they agree, don't agree, uh, will change, have different ideas, whatever it is that they perhaps may be uh, commenting on, but they at least comment, they at least acknowledge that they understand that the Inspector General has reviewed, this is his recommendation, and we should get a response back. Do you think that any of these one through six that you recommended on page 24, you will hear back as to what improvements um, perhaps have been made and if uh, there's changes or differences of opinion? Uh, I, I do believe that we will hear back. Uh, we've worked cooperatively with Maggie Keenan, uh, and she is supportive of all of these, in fact, enthusiastic about all of these. And, and I think your larger point is important, which is, uh, so for departments uh, and, and directors like Ms. Keenan, it's great because they are responsive. Right. Uh, but sometimes uh, without a requirement in our ordinance that people respond, they can get ignored. And so one of our difficulties with the Department of Development loan portfolio was before Mr. Huth came, before Mr. Edwards came, uh, many of our reports and recommendations were simply ignored. Yeah. And so you know, if, as we reexamine uh, the ordinances supporting my office uh, in the next year or so, we could put in a requirement that there be some response and the departments could tell us we're wrong, uh, that's fine, uh, or that they disagree or there's a better way to fix things. Uh, but it would be helpful to have a response, and I think that will help corrective action. And, you know, we open ourselves up, I think, by not asking for a response for an outside party, the media or other that are looking in, to asking why is this continuing when we've already had and gone through the work of understanding that there are some issues. So there should be a response and an acceptance of what it is that has been commented. And whether, as I say, agree, disagree, change, have other ideas, that is really not important. The important part is that they responded and uh, give you the courtesy to know that um, there are some issues perhaps that should be looked at and what is your response? So I would agree that all departments should, if looked at and um, given some criticism or even, you know, things that you find are exceptional should be acknowledged in those departments so that you feel that your work has been for, for the good. Let, let me give you uh, two examples, I think, uh, of that response and that interactive process. Uh, so uh, Ms. Woods has been here now. I think this is her second week. Perhaps it's her third week. And uh, her first project is to review uh, what the um, Sheriff's Department d has done in response to a report that we issued about a year and a half ago regarding uh, um, process servers who were not working their full shifts. And uh, one of the things that we have learned is they, in fact, have responded. They looked at our, our report. They've made a number of staffing changes. And, in fact, the, the savings are going to be, uh, you know, not insignificant, over $150,000 a year simply by doing things better. So that's an example of where responses are helpful. Uh, there are also areas where, where we don't necessarily dis agree with the department. So one of the things that we've recommended with respect to department development loans is that there be a hard close at the end of every month. And in going back and forth, they've indicated that, hey, if they do that because of the software system they, they use, they're going to lose data as a result. So that's a situation where they don't agree with us, but at least they have a reason and they have a response. So uh, that's a lot better than getting no response at all. Right. 
And I would agree with you that Maggie Keenan is exceptional. I mean, she's, she's great. Very responsive, and I've never had any question that I've asked not been answered immediately, if not within the same hour or day. So that is uh, that. Yes, I agree. She's an outstanding employee. Yeah, yes, go ahead. No. And, and to your point of, of lack of response, that's that's another area that we deal with regularly. Constituents who constantly need a response from a county department and agency. I could not see any reason why right. this committee could not demand a list of, 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 of non-responsive calls that you've gotten so that we can continue to be aware of, of the non-response and, right. um, and help you as we would help any constituent. Great. We would Another, appreciate that. Um, suggestion that you made on page 25 that I also hope will be considered and that is the, um, the creation of new jobs in our community by the Department of Development, that we don't rely just on um, self-reporting by the borrowers, but that we actually take a look at the uh, data from the tax collection and other agencies that give us the physical data that support what it is that that department is doing, and not just, yes, we think we're doing a good job, and uh, we may have some examples, but I, I think that if we're really going to follow it, I think that suggestion is a good one, and um, we should take that seriously. Thank you. All right, so any other questions on Section 2 before we move on? I was Section, curious as yes. to which um, uh, investigation that you have initiated. You, you've taken a lot of complaint, phone calls. Um, but there's a pie chart where you are initiating can you give us a sense of what you have, uh, what investigation you've initiated? Uh, sure. So I don't want to go too far back in uh, ancient history, but so, for example, uh, Department of Development, that's an example. Um, I think it's it's no surprise that there are, um, there are questions relating to administration of jails, of our jail system. Uh, that's, a, that's an example of things that we have looked at. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to think offhand of, of things that we have initiated. Uh, and as I'm caught in the lights here, I, I things don't come immediately to mind. Um, uh, well, so late contracts, uh, the fact that, and when I say late contracts, the fact that uh, departments are spending money uh, before it's been approved by the Board of Control, that was, an, that was a self-initiated uh, investigation. Um, and I apologize, I'm blanking on the others. Okay, so that's all right. So that, that's an, that's enough. All right, we're trying. Mm -hmm. So on to section three for the ethics compliance. Um, you know, it's good to see that you do have an open door for anyone in the county if they have any question about what is right or what is wrong, or if there's any gray area that they think I better ask. That your door is open to answer those questions. I mean, not only do you have the education of uh, trying to reach out, but you also will answer any question that comes before you um, so that that employee really does have a good foundation for what he, they can or cannot do. We really want to be preventative. And so, so we're doing a couple things with respect to ethics education, which then leads to ethics advisories. Uh, one is, uh, and this is at the request of the county executive, we are trying to uh, circulate through every leadership department uh, every department's leadership to have ethics education, uh, which then uh, inspires or spurs uh, a number of requests or questions for our own ethics opinions. So we found this number to go up. The other thing that we try to do is we try to send out our ethics updates uh, that reflect what we think are current issues. So yeah. we're coming into the political season, uh, and so we sent out an ethics update uh, last week with respect to uh, political involvement so that both uh, classified and unclassified employees know what they can do. So so that's what we're trying to do in terms of, of preventative issues. That's all good. Any questions on uh, Section 3? Okay. No. Moving on. Yeah. Moving on to Section 4 for the contractors and uh, lobbyists. The only question I had on page 34 was the additional uh, dollars that were identified the 700,000 and the uh, total of 2.4 million. I know that's a fiscal 
um, responsibility to um, investigate that. Have you been able to get an answer back on whether or not that's been identified? Uh, so, we, so we followed up on that, and there are uh, four um, significant debtors that comprise that amount. Uh, of those, one has fully repaid its, and I'm looking for my chart somewhere here, one fully repaid its, its debt. Um, of the other three, uh, there are judgment liens uh, with respect to two of them, uh, and uh, one, as I understand, is is uh, has been reached out to for a payment of an additional eight thousand dollars. But but uh, but so uh, two are currently in the kind of collection process as it is. And if they are in that collection process, uh, we of course have a red flag, so that there aren't uh, contracts that they are bidding on when we have back taxes due? Uh, that's correct. So the, the one entity that paid its taxes received money last year, but they had uh, brought their tax uh, delinquency current before they received the money. Of the other three, uh, one of them did not receive any money last year. Uh, one received $3,444 uh, at the beginning of last year. And the, the fourth one received $300. Uh, it, but on each of those, it's, it's yeah. too much. And we ought to uh, use our, our uh, collection processes to not pay contractors who owe us money. I'm glad you're paying attention to that. Any questions on the four point? Uh, one question. Uh, it appears you've had a, a, a large delegation of countries come to learn what we do. Did they all have the similar problems or challenges or was there any? Uh, it, it is great and tiring. Um, so the United States State Department, as part of its uh, education and outreach program, brings delegations from all across the world. And this morning we had a delegation from Latin America of, I want to say, 10 representatives from mayors to parliamentarians to, uh, to lawyers and, and activists. Uh, and so... Uh, it's been Asia, Africa, uh, South America, you know, you name it. And so I, we apparently are now on their list of places that the State Department brings people uh, to come see, uh, not because we're perfect, but because we've had an issue and uh, to have a discussion about what our approach is. So um, the group today from, from uh, I can't even tell you the different, all the different Panama, Chile, Argentina, Honduras, wow. uh, a lot. Um, they started their trip in Washington, D.C., where they met with the Office of Government Ethics. They met with uh, some whistleblower uh, uh, entities. Uh, their next stop was Cleveland. They're going to go to Salt Lake City, and then they're going to finish in Dallas. And uh, I think that the State Department has found that our county and our office uh, is an example of at least what we're trying to do to address a problem. Um, not that we're perfect, but but uh, we are, I guess, now something that the United States holds out or the State Department holds out as something to look at. Hmm. Yes. Have we had any contingencies from Russia? Uh, none. Not yet? None. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was your... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. Well, in that same Section 5, um, I just wanted to reinforce um, what I think is important that I know that you do on a quarterly basis, and that is to review the, the uh, driver's license. But yes. I would like to, you know, really perhaps at least consider that when we have our employees go on extended trips, that things happen even between quarters, and that if they're getting behind a county vehicle um, and going to a, somewhere where it may take them a day or two to get there, that we should have, as, a, as, as policy... Um, a check on their suspended license or a check on their license to see whether or not they just had a DUI, la DUI last week or had an accident that was unreported or something where um, we may not have known in that quarter that we have an employee getting behind the wheel of an extended trip that perhaps uh, got in trouble with their vehicle. And I think that it only takes a matter of just inserting a few numbers and that that department head that is sending that employee could do that without really hardly uh, any effort. And that doing it quarterly is great, and I, you've found employees that have had some expired license, suspended license, 
had some that were suspended but then reinstated. That's all good that we're checking that. But I also think that to take the next step of making sure that when they get behind the wheel in a county vehicle, any extended trip should be checked as a matter of policy so that we are assured that we aren't putting ourselves at risk. And, you know, perhaps down the road we can take a closer look at that. But I thank you for, for checking those licenses. It's important that we do that. Um, any other questions? Yes. I, yes. I'm going back to section 4.3 okay. about the debarment, and I think Councilman Jones asked about that. So do we have one that's pending, an active debarment? Uh, we do have a, a, well, that is in the process of, and, and this has to do with uh, cyber, um, and and so we are looking at that, and one of the issues is that that company is going through the bankruptcy process, uh, and uh, I am told that it will no longer be a going concern, and it's going to go through dissolution rather than reorganization. So, uh, so some of its contractual obligations have been picked up by uh, third parties, by Infor, uh, but we still have this issue of this prior entity, and and uh, so we've been going back and forth with uh, their counsel, and in fact, some of the employees uh, have gone over to Infor. So, so. Uh, you know, that's a question of are we going to debar a company that is uh, out of business and being dissolved? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. So, so I asked because I'm on the debarment board, the appeal board, and wondered if this was something that we would have to address. It doesn't look like it. Uh, you we'll know, it, it really is a question of do we make a statement by, by debarring this company or is it not a good use of county resources? I, I you know... I could see it either way, so. Good. All right, and then just wrapping, do you have a question? It, it just made me think about uh, the elections coming up. I don't know if this is your your area of expertise or are there any uh, concerns or anything that you look into in terms of the uh, the yes. safety of our elections, so, upcoming elections, and what, what part do you play in that? So, so, uh, there's a question about whether it's within our jurisdiction because, it, 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 you know, it, until the charter gets changed, my jurisdiction is limited to those that are in the executive branch. But our IT department is within the executive branch. So uh, I, I have met with Jeremy Mio three times now regarding election security and election protection. Uh, and he is pretty confident that, that uh, the election is going to be secure. And... Uh, he explained to me in all sorts of detail that I didn't really understand uh, about how the system is separated. And, and, and let me try to convey a little bit about what he conveyed to me. Uh, the first core part is that we have paper ballots. And so we have a voter-created paper trail as opposed to electronic uh, ballots. And I don't know if you're aware, there's, a, there's litigation in uh, Georgia right now for this uh, gubernatorial election to replace the electronic uh, machines because they're susceptible to hacking with what we in Ohio already have. So we start from that basis with a voter-created paper trail, which then go into uh, the optical scanners. And uh, Mr. Mio went through a, a number of ways in which those machines are kept separate from the internet and they're kept separate from, uh, uh, from the ability to hack. Uh, and and I'm always skeptical about any of these things, and, and um, I don't want to go into detail for two reasons. One is I don't really understand the detail, and then secondly, if I explained it, it might, it might uh, eliminate some or might provide some sort of um, security issue. Uh, but in short, there's a lot of separation. It's my understanding that uh, the state authorities have requested that every board of elections submit a report about election security I believe I was told uh, by October 15th. So that is going forward as well. Um, so, so in answer to your question, uh, I have had meetings about that. Uh, they appear to be secure, at least I've gotten assurances that that's the case, and explanations that at least to my lawyer's education seem to make sense uh, as, best, as best I can. Um, you know, the one thing I would say is, is because we have paper ballots, we can always rerun them and recount them. So, so as long as we do that, there's a way to then go back and audit uh, whether our final count matches with the paper ballots. Is everyone across the country uh, keeping a paper trail? 
No. no. Uh, so during the, the 2000s in particular, there was a, a, um, an effort or there was a wave towards uh, essentially having ATMs being electronic. And, and as I mentioned in Georgia, that's an issue where a lot of the voters will not be voting on paper ballots. Uh, but it's my understanding that because of security issues, most experts now believe that, that we need to have paper ballots. Um, there was a time uh, as recently as four years ago where some counties in Ohio were still using uh, the direct voter technology, the DVT terminals. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this is a, an example of people trying to do the right thing, but sometimes it, it backfires. So I want to say 12 or 16 years ago, the federal government had a lot of money to for people to go out and buy electronic uh, election technology. And so many counties in Ohio and around the country took the federal money, uh, and in some polling locations here in Cleveland, or here in Cuyahoga County also, they eliminated the voter paper trail. But uh, you know, as things progressed and as things didn't work out, uh, they then said, no, we need to, we need to have paper. Um, when I was involved in voter protection, I want to say 12 years ago, um, the voter records were uh, essentially put onto a flash drive for each machine. Well, one bag of those got lost from one precinct, and those votes just disappeared. So uh, that's not something that's likely to happen with paper. Mm -hmm. okay. I hope that was an answer to your question. It was. Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right. Then, um, you know, finally you have your goals, which um, I know you, you certainly have been – You've had a busy department, and so to look forward uh, instead of uh, behind, I see that you have some goals that look like they are similar to what you have already done and perhaps moving forward, uh, letting a few of them go. On the three that you have mentioned, of course, um, the higher the full-time IT and big data analysts, that's, been, that's checked off, so that's, that's really good to hear. The reviewing of the contract compliance, which was a first half goal, do you anticipate that you will continue that? Is there a reason why that wasn't included as one of your second half goals? Uh, I, yes, I, you know, I think that the answer there is that um, with many of the things going on with, with cooperation with law enforcement entities uh, and others, uh, that we thought that that may not be the the uh, top priority at this time. But mm -hmm. I, I want to say this, which is we are responsive. I am responsive to the general public, but also particularly to counsel and to the executive. And so, uh, you know, if there's a feeling from this oversight committee, I mean, your job is to, in part, guide me on what you want me to do. So if the feeling is we want you to do more of this contract compliance and oversight, uh, then I'm responsive to that. You know, I would think that that's, that is an important piece. I mean, it's a judgment call on, you know, where you are at in your, your scope of work. Um, also, the oversight of the departments, uh, as we have with the uh, Department of Development, that I don't see listed either as this goal for second half to continue overseeing and making sure that uh, all of that is followed through. As we said earlier, perhaps we can finally bring closure to the first uh, – First form okay. of government, and then hopefully move on to the second form. That would be nice to perhaps have a goal okay. that we can check that off the next time we talk to you. Great. Um, any others that you thought of that you'd like to see the IG work on outside of what he's listed here on page 45? Nothing. You're good. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you. It is a pleasure to come and speak with you, and, and I want everyone to know that I'm available you know, outside of these twice-a-year meetings, and feel free to call me at any time on my uh, office phone, my cell phone, or my email. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there any miscellaneous business? Hearing none, we are adjourned.